Hi, biology class. This is Mr. Yago, and uh, as part of your infectious disease unit, I'm going to talk about viruses. Viruses are pretty cool uh, little guys or gals, um, although many people do not think that they are alive, and I agree with that statement. Um, we're going to talk about how viruses are among the absolute smallest biological particles capable of causing disease in living organisms. So maybe you're asking yourself, how can something that is not alive cause a disease in a living organism? Okay, well, there's a couple things that we're going to learn about them that will hopefully change your mind. But before we do that, let's look at the size of these particular viruses. And they range from 20 nanometers to 250 nanometers. That is very, very small. Nano makes that number very, very small. Um, they lack a nucleus. They have no cytoplasm, no organelles, no cell membrane. And they cannot carry out any cellular functions. So that's what does it for me. That's what solidifies the fact that viruses are definitely not alive. They lack the components of living cells. However, here's the catch. They can replicate by infecting themselves in healthy cells and using the organelles and enzymes within them. So essentially, a virus will hijack a healthy cell, insert its DNA, and basically go through two phases that we'll talk about and either make more viruses or make infected new infected cells all right all right now here's a little chart that I would like you guys to get down essentially I have three columns that I'm going to go through I'm going to talk about a characteristic of life and how it varies in a virus in a cell because as I mentioned before a virus is not really alive um, cells most definitely alive so let's look at the first one growth do viruses have the ability to grow? The answer is no, but cells do. Homeostasis, which essentially um, means stable internal environments. So an example I'm going to give you of how your body utilizes homeostasis, it's body temperature, 98.6. So anything it can do to regulate that um, is considered homeostasis. Can a virus do that? No. Can a cell do that? Yes. Metabolism? Definite no for virus, definite yes for the cell. Can a cell mutate? Yes. Can a virus mutate? Absolutely. Well, how is its nucleic acid? Well, most of our cells, at least in beings like us, are considered of the DNA variety, uh, whereas nu nucleic acid in the viruses can be their DNA or RNA. Reproduction. Independently by cell division, which we learned. Viruses, however, need a host cell. Structure, they have a nucleic acid core and basically proteins. Structure, proteins that are covering and in some cases an envelope. Now in a cell, we have all of our organelles. So there are some major differences between a cell and a virus that I want you to understand. So all viruses have two essential features. What those features are, are nucleic acid, which is essentially is DNA, okay, or RNA in this case, we can have it either way. And that's going to be involved in this uh, capsid, so to speak, which is a protein coat that surrounds it. So all viruses at least have this top portion. Everything else can be a little bit different. So let's move on and take a look at some more stuff on virus. So virus shape may be determined by its capsid, which I just mentioned is that top part that contains the DNA or its actual DNA or RNA. To be enveloped is a term that I'm going to be used, and that's essentially very similar to how you'd put a letter. You put a letter in an envelope. That envelope is a membrane outside of the capsid made of lipids, which is going to essentially keep everything on the inside. It's very similar to the cell membrane in our cells that we've discussed in the past. Um, and what they're going to do is they've taken from a host cell that membrane during replication. So that allows the virus to infect the healthy cell. So a virus would essentially penetrate into the healthy tissue of a healthy cell and basically give it its DNA. Um, and an enveloped viruses that have a membrane around it would be considered something like HIV virus, which is right here. This whole thing is an envelope. And if you could zoom in kind of uh, on uh, these areas, make it a little bit bigger so you guys can see. Right here is where you can see those lipids, okay? phospholipids, which we've talked about numerous times in this class, okay? So that's a little bit on its shape. Let's go into a little more detail. So 
A virus shape may it be determined by its capsid nucleic acid that I mentioned in the previous slide. So we have an example of an enveloped virus like HIV. Here is some of the most coolest viruses. Icosahedron, and that speaks to its capsule on top. That is considered an icosahedron, which means 20 triangular faces. Um, viruses like chickenpox, polio, and herpes, this is polio here, that's chickenpox, um, has this icosahedron virus. And a lot of times what happens is these little legs will attach and then this DNA will be injected into that host cell. Pretty crazy stuff. Another shape of virus is a helix or helical virus. And rabies and measles is an actually an example. And you can see how this is basically a spring, very similar to um, a suspension coil in a car. And uh, that just speaks to its shape. So this is three different things that we've discussed. Enveloped, like HIV, um, icosahedron, like polio, and helix, like rabies. And all those are differing features that basically differentiate different types of viruses. So a big question that, uh, that uh, we're going to look into is kind of a physiological process, um, how viruses replicate. Okay, so to replicate is to copy. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is something called the lytic cycle. And during this cycle, a virus will invade the host cell, produce new viruses, destroy the host cell, and then release newly formed viruses. Okay, so viruses that undergo the cycle are called, are called virulent because they cause disease. Essentially, in this case, the disease would be for us as human beings the fact that those host cells, which are our healthy cells, are being destroyed. And this new virus is proliferating and copying itself throughout the body. All right, now here's one of your diagrams. And this is a very, very important. And this is the process of how the lytic cycle works. So right here, we have a healthy cell. And inside of that cell, we have normal healthy DNA. That icosahedron, as you can see up there, or a specific type of virus, is going to attach itself. That is step one of this lytic cycle. Step, step two, you can see that it is injecting its DNA all right, into the host. So here's all the cell's DNA, and here is the virus injecting its DNA. Now, what that, now what's going to occur is there's going to be a synthesis of viral genomes and proteins. So essentially, it's using the host cell's materials and how it copies and goes through mitosis and creates new cells, except it's using it to create the new parts of the bacteria, or excuse me, the virus. So you can see the capsid and the body and the tail fibers, as you can see here, are all being copied and made inside the host cell. Step four, they assemble it. Step five, the release. And notice upon release, when those viruses break out of there, this is where we have cell lysis, which is part of the word lytic. Lysis, or light, means to kill. So essentially, when those viruses are assembled and put together, they break out of that cell, and that essentially kills it. So this is a lytic cycle. Make sure you get these down in your diagrams, and you'll be good to go. All right, next up, we have the lysogenic cycle. This one's a little bit different, okay? During this cycle, the virus can actually stay in the host cell for an extended period of time. So we would call this an incubating period, meaning that you could be exposed to the virus today and might not see symptoms till a week, a month, sometimes even a years, okay? And it doesn't kill the host cell immediately, but it essentially creates an infected cell and multiplies that cell, not the virus, okay? That is very important to know. In the previous slide, I talked about the lytic cycle where we make new viruses. This is actually infecting a cell with unhealthy DNA, copying it, and basically making two unhealthy cells. So how do we treat and prevent viral diseases? One of the major ways that we can prevent this is vaccination. And there's a lot of controversy over vaccinations right now. A lot of people are thinking that these vaccinations are eventually going to lead to disabilities, mental health issues, physical health issues um, later on in life. Um, I am a huge, huge supporter of vaccinations. Now, what happens if we don't vaccinate is that these diseases that we know we have cured and have the ability to prevent will start becoming prevalent, okay? So that is the most common prevention approach is vaccination that prevents the disease by inserting the pathogen in a low dosage into the body, allowing that 
allowing excuse me, your immune system to provide pr protection against that pathogen. So let's say we have something like measles. You get Usually when you're born, you get something called measles, mumps, rubella, um, MMR. And that would be low dosages of that specific virus put into your body. Your body will recognize it, develop antibodies, and then be able to fight it off later. Um, we also have something which isn't very popular, and there's very few of them. It's called antiviral drugs. And essentially what they do is they interfere with the virus's nucleic acid synthesis. So essentially they mess up its ability to replicate. So these are two methods that we can use to treat and prevent viral disease. So, we have two types of those viral diseases, and I just want to kind of give you a, a definition of both. And we have inactivated ones and attenuated ones. And inactivated viruses do not replicate in a host system, okay? Attenuated viruses have been genetically altered so that they are incapable of causing diseases. So, they might put in a vaccination an inactivated virus, which basically is that virus, and it doesn't have the ability to replicate. So although you have that virus in your body, it doesn't have the tools to replicate and therefore proliferate and cause you any illness. So on the other hand, we also have attenuated viruses, and they've been genetically altered so that they're incapable of causing disease. <clears throat> so they might be able to replicate throughout the body, but they don't have the ability or the parts to cause you any symptoms. Okay, So these are two types of viruses involved in the process of treating and preventing these viral diseases. So I hope you have a good understanding of what viruses are. Again, we could talk for days about these viruses, but I want you to get a grip on what is a virus, how is it classified, mostly by shape, and also by its nucleic acid, how is it similar and different from a healthy cell, and then finally, what are two ways that those viruses can proliferate, the lytic cycle and the lysogenic cycle. And to end it here, we talked about what are some ways we can treat and prevent them? So if you have an understanding of those things that I mentioned, you'll have a great understanding of viruses. That's all I got. Yago, out.